Hi, I'm Laura Waters, an HIV doctor from central London, and I shall be talking about avoiding and minimising art toxicity. Here are my disclosures. And I'll be covering briefly some principles of toxicity reporting. Then I'll be using examples of toxicity from individual drugs and classes. And more importantly, what are the key general lessons we can learn? And finally, I'll touch on the future. So starting with toxicity reporting, there are some really important things to consider when we're looking at studies and the risk of different adverse events. Firstly, baseline characteristics. Now, baseline characteristics can have a major impact on the risk of toxicity and can really limit our abilities to compare studies. We rarely see detail in trials on the grade and duration of adverse events. And knowing, for example, that most adverse events resolve within a short period of time is really important when counselling patients. The comparator can impact the adverse events reported, particularly in blinded trials, thanks to the placebo effect. Other art components are crucial, and in the Bictegravir first nine studies, 1489 and 1490, we saw a real difference in nausea and insomnia rates in the dolutegravir arms, according to whether dolutegravir was prescribed with abacavir imivudine or tenofovir alafenamide and entricitabine as a backbone. So understanding the impact of components, not necessarily attributing differences to the main drug is important. The bias of familiarity and the fact that when investigators are assigning causality in trials, if, an unknown, if a side effect is already known, they may be more likely to attribute that to a drug, whereas if it's a new side effect not previously reported, they may be less likely to do so. And finally, and rarely reported, is the impact of adverse events and toxicities on quality of life and activities of daily living. How do these impact patients? Now, where can we get our information on toxicity? Well, firstly, we can garner information from preclinical studies. So, for example, if we think about older NRTIs and their impact on mitochondrial toxicity, modern drugs being studied in terms of polymerase gamma affinity, and that's the enzyme that binding of NRTIs drives mitochondrial toxicity, that preclinical information can help give us some idea of what future toxicities may be. Clinical trials are of course essential, but they may not be large enough to detect rare events, and they rarely are undertaken for long enough in order to detect longer term adverse events, which is where cohorts come in. But of course there we see the biases of confounding and the fact that drivers of whether someone's on treatment A or treatment B may also drive differences in toxicity rates. And of course, other post-marketing surveillance and using the various reporting systems that regulatory authorities provide. None of these are perfect. They all have limitations. And often we need to use these different sources of information as jigsaw pieces to try and create a whole picture. But we are still often left with gaps. Now, moving on to some selected toxicities and their management and key principles we can consider. Now, I'm going to start and focus mainly on NRTIs or nucleoside analogues. And I think no class better exemplifies the transition from ugly duckling to beautiful swan. And modern NRTIs compared to the original NRTIs really do illustrate huge improvements in terms of toxicity and tolerability. Now, if we look at the kind of pre-heart, pre-mid-1990s NRTIs, they're listed here, Zidovudine, Dadanacine, Zalcitabine and Stavudine. And other than Zidovudine, none of these are used routinely today. The issue, as I've already mentioned, is mitochondrial dysfunction and the fact that as well as binding to reverse transcriptase, which we want them to do, they also bind to polymerase gamma. That's what drives mitochondrial toxicity. And in turn, that's what drives toxicities such as anemia, lipoatrophy and pancreatitis. So that we understand the mechanism, um, which is why it's important when lamivudine, which also strictly speaking is a pre-heart NRTI, lamivudine was developed so it had low affinity for polymerase gamma, high affinity for reverse transcriptase, low affinity for polymerase gamma, and if it did bind, it was excised very quickly. So lamivudine actually, as we know as a drug we still use widely today, uh, not associated with major mitochondrial toxicity. So lesson one, 
is it's important to investigate the mechanisms of key toxicities and design drugs in the future that minimize that risk. Now, what about our post-heart, post-mid-1990s NRTIs? We've got a Bacavir, Tenofovir, Disaproxil, and Emtricitabine, all with a low propensity for mitochondrial toxicity. Now, a Bacavir introduced a new type of NRTI toxicity, a Bacavir hypersensitivity, an allergic reaction, but the introduction of HLA-B5701 screening has eliminated a Bacavir hypersensitivity by and large, though it still remains a clinical diagnosis. Tenofovir DF, of course, we know can be associated with renal and bone toxicity, and the understanding that that correlated with plasma tenofovir exposure uh, triggered the development of TAF or tenofovir allophenamide, a new formulation of tenofovir which has been available since 2016. And thanks to lower plasma tenofovir concentrations, we see less impact on renal and bone markers. So lessons two and three are that utilizing pharmacogenetics where we can, and in fact, Abacavir remains the most successful example of a pharmacogenetic implementation in medicine, though it's a very hot area right now, and minimizing drug exposure where it's possible to do so. However, every action has a reaction and, and TAF, although undoubtedly highly effective and, and safe and well tolerated, you do see higher intracellular tenofovir concentrations. So the plasma concentrations are lower, but intracellular concentrations are higher. Now that may not have any major implications, but we must consider some of the signals that warrant further exploration. Netherlands cohort data suggesting a higher risk of emergent cardiac events on TAF, though of course confounders could account for that. The TANGO study suggests that there may be an impact of TAF on insulin sensitivity because switching away from TAF-based therapy to dolutegavir and mifidine, particularly in people on a boosted TAF-based regimen at baseline, led to improvements in insulin sensitivity. And of course, the question mark around weight, which I'll come back to later, but undoubtedly switching from TDF to TAF in suppressed individuals does lead to weight gain. And whether that's normalization of weight or not is still debated. Of course, the other way to reduce drug exposure is to reduce the number of drugs that you're giving. So can two drug regimens rather than three reduce toxicity? The answer for some is yes. And if you give a two drug regimen, versus Truvada or TDF and, and uh, emtricitabine with a third drug, then there are studies showing that, as you might expect, renal and bone markers are better. So a non-TDF2 drug regimen is associated with less renal and bone biomarker changes than a TDF, FTC and third drug, three drug regimen. And that's illustrate, illustrated in the trials listed. Maybe I've already talked about insulin sensitivity and there's some other metabolic markers, lipids, for example, uh, that suggest it's possible moving away from TAF to a two drug regimen may improve some metabolic markers, so that's less clear. Now, a contentious question is inflammation and some of the debate around two versus three three drugs is based on data related to inflammation. Now there's one Spanish cohort, for example, that showed that inflammatory markers were worse in people switched to two drug regimens versus three. However, it was a cohort study. And of course, people who had had NRTIs removed from their regimens may well have had that done for a reason. So a higher rate of comorbidities, for example, could have been driving differences in inflammation over time. The SWORD study, which was the suppressed switch study comparing dolutegravir real piverine dual therapy against continued three drug regimens. There was a neutral impact on inflammatory markers or a slight advantage for two drug regimens. So I think we really don't know yet what these inflammatory markers mean and whether any of these studies have followed people up long enough to really understand the picture. An honest question though is when did we start judging regimens on inflammatory marker endpoints? I guess it's one of the examples of how privileged we are that we we have so many effective regimens, we're now honing in on more and more obscure, dare I suggest, endpoints uh, to find differences between drugs.
On the subject, moving back to uh, cardiovascular risk, as we touched on uh, for TAF, of course, a back of ear is the NRTI most associated with an increase in cardiovascular risk. And there's a number of uh, mechanisms that have emerged, endothelial dysfunction, vascular inflammation, and an impact on platelet aggregation, because a back of ear mimics endogenous purines, which can be th pro-thrombotic and pro-inflammatory. So this leads me on to lesson four, which is avoiding some drugs in people at higher risk of a particular toxicity. So as we learn more about toxicity profiles of different drugs, so we select the populations best or least suited to those drugs so we can tailor their regimens accordingly. Now, of course, not all toxicity is direct and drug-drug interactions are an important cause of toxicity. Boosters, of course, are a major culprit and, and steroids and Cushing syndrome, statins and rhabdomyolysis are just two examples of the indirect toxicity caused by blocking the cytochrome system through boosters. Another example is real pivarine and real pivarine, although low risk, could have an impact on QT interval length. And if you then combine it with a drug like citalopram, there is a caution around prescribing those two drugs together, just as another example. So for lesson five, avoiding boosters, absolutely, but making sure we counsel patients and other healthcare professionals about key drug-drug interaction to minimize that as a source of toxicity. And we're always learning. I mentioned weight earlier. Here's one of the classic studies. This is a pooled analysis of eight first line Gilead studies, uh, which was written up by Paul Sachs and colleagues. But you'll be very familiar with the fact that the second generation integrases and TAF being most associated with the phenomenon of excess weight gain. However, more recently, the debate has shifted as to how much of this is true weight gain versus the loss of weight loss. So the idea that older drugs and the two particularly implicated are TDF and efavirenz, that these older drugs were driving weight loss. So if you're not using those, you're seeing relative weight gain. And for me, the most compelling part of that argument is this data from Croy, looking at the use of different regimens in pregnancy. And it was dolutegravir with FTC and TAF, a regimen associated with excess weight gain or interpreted as excess weight gain in studies such as ADVANCE, it was that regimen that was associated with weight gain in pregnancy closest to normal. So that dotted line along the top is normal weight gain in the second and third trimesters. And you can see it was dolutegravir, FTC and TAF where that weight gain for women with HIV closely approached normal. So lesson six is understanding general population trends is key to interpreting new toxicities. And really using weight again as an example, we could pick other changes, whether it's antiretroviral related or not, it's really important we counsel people. So using weight as an example, counseling people that weight gain may occur, making sure we explain it may not be specifically down to the drug, emphasizing lifestyle, exercise, and particularly diet, but making sure that we are doing the appropriate monitoring of individuals, but also collecting our data, because the more data we collect and the better we understand these changes, then the better we can manage our patients. And just to finish on laboratory abnormalities, now some are very predictable, such as the impact of several antiretrovirals on tubular secretion of creatinine, which leads to fairly predictable changes in estimated GFR. Many laboratory abnormalities that were quite common several years ago are much less common now, and transaminitis is a good example of that. But the key principles here, again, are communication. If you're starting or switching to a drug associated with creatinine innervations, for example, making sure that you communicate that to other healthcare professionals. Understanding that trends in general are more important than isolated results and really exploring change, mapping the change in an individual laboratory abnormality over time and correlating that with changes in HIV and non-HIV medication. If we use transaminitis as an example, mapping that against weight change or alcohol consumption is really important to try and understand what the main drivers are. And excluding other causes is crucial. And as art-related toxicity gets less common, 
then it's more likely that it's non-drug causes or non-antiretroviral causes driving some of these changes. So again, using liver enzyme changes, excluding viral hepatitis, syphilis, and other common drivers. So just to end on the future. Now, obviously, as drugs are developed in general, we're seeing better tolerated, less toxic drugs, ongoing development of drugs with less drug-drug interaction potential. And I was very interested to see in a talk recently from the god of drug interactions, Professor David Back, that ibilizumab as a monoclonal antibody has no important drug-drug interactions, which is quite novel to see. Better individualization, though, has got to be part of the future in terms of drug choice, drug dose, and also drug timing. So this brings me on to pharmacogenomics, again, a very hot field of exploration at the moment, and really, I think, will form an increasing part of prescribing both of antiretrovirals, but also drugs across other disease areas. One example is we already know for some people that dolutegravir concentrations may be linked to risk of insomnia. So this study here showed that for people experiencing insomnia on dolutegravir, dosing it in the morning was helpful. This is some data on UGT polymorphisms and showing that they have an impact on dolutegravir concentrations, which in turn had an impact on risk of neuropsychiatric adverse events. And sticking with integrases, this is another study that looked at various single nucleotide polymorphisms and their impact on integrase concentrations. The higher the concentration, the higher risk of adverse events. And abnormal dreams, which were actually more common on rautegravir than alpha tegravir or dolutegravir were one of those adverse events that correlated with concentrations. Of note, bictegravir wasn't included in this study. So to conclude, toxicity and tolerability profiles undoubtedly improve over time and better reporting both within trials but after drugs are licensed will facilitate better management. Understanding mechanisms is key, but appropriate counselling careful mapping and exclusion of other causes should be standard to all of our practice. So I shall end there by thanking you for your kind attention.